click, click through, try to send this box to the SOB, Click through to the sister and spots with the SOB up hot for a minute.
top of the evening there, YouTubers in Lawn World. It is Thirsty Thursday. However, it's not Thursday. It's Friday of a long holiday weekend. So we've entitled this version Wreck Your Holiday Weekend. If you do it right tonight, folks, the rest of the weekend's going to suck. I promise you. Now, with us tonight, we do not have our fearless leader, Mr. Matt Martin. He is in the place where the moonshine flows like wine and the meth heads instinctively flock like the salmon of Capistrano. I'm talking about a little place called Kentucky. But we do have Mr. Ray Ito. Ray, how are you this evening? Ah, other than not have, showing any video, I am extremely well. <laughs> Well, you know, we all like to pretend when the coconut comes on the screen that you're in there, maybe in your skivvies, maybe less. We don't know. But uh, we really appreciate that you did put your avatar for your OnlyFans up here tonight. That's very much appreciated, sir. Well, for, for the record, <laughs> Just, let's see. I'm dressed, I'm showered, and uh, my hair is done. So. That's good. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Now, folks, if you want to see any more than that, it's going to be ten ninety nine a month. All right. He will do private <laughs> shows of anything you want, right? So I think I think I saw that new one you had out, right? It was you and your Greensmaster 1000 in a banana hammock, right? That one was like $27 to buy. So, you know, if you want to get on there, check it out. Check it out. Now, also <laughs> with us this evening is our good friend Matt. Not Matt Martin, but Matt from uh, right around central Illinois. Matt, good evening, sir. How are you? Oh, dude, Springfield, Illinois. You? I'm yeah, doing great. I'm doing thing. great. Now, how many... Uh, that, how many uh, you know, Simpsons jokes and all that kind of crap do you get living in Springfield, Illinois? It's got to be unnerving, I would think. Um, I don't get too many of them, but uh, it's okay. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. So, you know, I'm sure you're a fan of the show. I think you emailed Matt and wanted to come on and, and talk a little bit. So kind of give us your background. You said you're in Springfield, Illinois. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, in the central part of the state, so a little bit downstate from uh, yeah, Chicago land, city. a little bit north of Capital City, right there, and north of St. Louis. So kind of in that, uh, you guys mm -hmm. got a lot of rain this past week or two weeks ago. We got about whatever six it was, or it was seven inches this last week. So, Whew. okay, well, you know that's, uh, that that's saying something, right? It makes that grass green. It does. Six or seven inches will do make grass green and do a lot of other good things in this world. So um, <laughs> tell us how you got here and, you know, kind of take us from, you know, where you're at now in your lawn journey and just, again, like how you got here and just sit in front of us. Um, I, I, well, I bought this house and um, I've always tried to take care of my yard in the past. Uh, so I was basically inherited weed infested lawn. Um, so I went out to the box stores and bought, you know, the weed be gone and stuff like that. Uh, and then about two years ago, I went on YouTube because I have some zoysia grass in my yard. Uh, how do I get rid of the zoysia grass? Well, my dad's like, well, use this turf on ester. That should kill it. So I'm like, okay. So I never did, really didn't use it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I typed remove zoysia grass from uh tall turf fescue uh and matt martin's video showed up and he's out there on some golf course or some lake video you know doing mm -hmm. uh treatments and updates and stuff like that so i watched him and then i streamed through a bunch of his other videos and uh kind of watched him and then i you know i ventured over to the the lawn care nut and then i saw uh uh, Pete Denny, um, just naming mm -hmm. the more, more bigger names. I mean, there's other ones like Ryan Knorr. I, I follow him. And actually, Ryan Knorr and the Grass Daddy are the ones that I basically followed and to the T. I probably watched their videos on renovations 10 times each. Um, <laughs> That's good. So I would, you know, I would sit there and because I, I, the zoysia grass during the wintertime, it was always brown until mid April. Mm -hmm uh may you know and i, I just didn't I, I i get ocd about things and the yard is one of them yeah so i emailed him i said okay how do i do this and he so he starts naming off all these active ingredients and uh and i'm like i don't want to do this mm. and so i i did the next easy step i just put glyphosate on my yard and uh started okay. over well so, there you go <laughs> that's that's it worked. <laughs> that's one way to do it is uh yeah yeah i mean uh, when you when you take the plunge from uh 
selectively controlling weeds and grasses and things yeah, like that. That's my yard now, filter, basically. Okay. That's that's basically a, a, a couple weeks after the glyphosate. So. Um, okay. I. Oh wow! That's yeah. The, when I, that's the day I planted right there. I, that's the day I threw out the grass seed. I took a um, a uh, oh gosh, what's the name? The thatcher, and I just I ran it mm -hmm. all the way down to the bottom. I was kicking up dirt, and uh, that was. I was actually getting lawn stripes from the deep thatcher, as you can see there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to yeah, say, those, and, those are some dirt stripes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are dirt stripes. So, and then, um, so I, I got the seed from Pete. Uh, I used the uh, Kentucky Bluegrass Turf Test, uh, Tall Turf Fescue blend right there. Um, I put that down on, well, I started the process the last week of July. And my only fear was rain. I didn't want you know, five inches of rain, you know, wash it out on my grass seed. I would rather spend a hundred dollars and not have, there's, there's after I put the, uh, the, um, peat moss on. And I basically started, that was, I took a shower cause I was, I was brown from head to toe from the, the peat moss. Uh, but, uh, Ray and Ryan. And I spread it out by hand. I didn't have one of those nice little rollers that people show. So, oh yeah. Um, so I, I took Ooh. a, took a bundle and, Walked it on the ground and you know, grabbed a handful and walked around with it. So, uh, yeah, that was hey, that was fun. So I, I planted the grass seed. I well, I did three applications of glyphosate, and okay. um, uh, I I went over to my neighbor's yard. He was out, and I said, "Okay, I'm just letting you know I'm up on my yard because he wouldn't understand what glyphosate is." And he goes, "Why?" And I was like, "Well, I'm not happy with my yard." And he goes, "Your yard looks nice. What? Why would you do that?" And I'm like. So three weeks. If only then, he understood. Then you get, <laughs> yes. So then, then I got the sprinklers out, and he goes, "I thought you were killing your grass." And I'm like, "Going well, I gotta. It's it's dormant right now. It's not gonna kill it if it's not growing." And he and I, I lost him at that point. So <laughs> I've watched a couple of grass. I've, I've I've watched a couple of grass videos, and basically, you know, I, like I said, I followed Ryan Nor and the Grass Daddy, um, and. Uh, so for about three weeks, I, I basically mowed my grass, you know, lower and lower and lower each time. And then the last time I got the dethatcher out and, you know, I, I went crisscross both times and um, mm -hmm. put, the, put some hydrotain down. I figured that can't hurt. I uh, put some uh, RGS down and I put the grass seed down. I watered it in for about, you know, an hour. Uh, then I put the peat moss on there and then I watered it out for about another hour. and I. Actually, I watered it five times a day for three weeks. About, you know, I could probably water it in three different stints uh, each, you know, for the whole zone for three different stints. I did that five or six times a day. And uh, I took off a work week, a week of work to, you know, make sure that I was on top of that because I didn't, I mean, I was, I was, you know, this That's isn't your intense. $5 grass I love it. at Ace Hardware. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> so, you know, I, I planted the grass on like the 11th of August and I had grass, a uh, little grass growings up of, uh, uh, that's probably you, you labeled maybe, this as one, one month. It. That's, oh, this one is one month, month right that's now. Pretty, that's okay, yeah, so that's pretty good for one month. This, this might be the one you're thinking that's two weeks. Yeah, that's probably that's my that's my youngest. She was impressed that I had the little uh, wheel mower, so she had to go through there. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't know where I was at because uh, I kind of flipped screens here. But so yeah, that, no, that, that was one month. It was probably I was probably eighty uh, percent filled in. Now the the little boulevard section that didn't grow very well at the first part. So then I ended up putting a different grass seed in there just because it was separated by concrete and couldn't get into that, my, my good grass seed. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's about 2,200 square feet, including the little boulevard section. That wasn't, it wasn't too bad to water. Um, I live in a very high water cost area. So what they sure. actually, they have is a, uh, um, one of those sewer bypass so basically, yeah, you hook that up meter. to your outside spigot. Yeah. Yep. So you hook that up there, and I saved. I used ten thousand gallons of water 
in two months. Never had a day over gallons. 95 degrees. Mm -hmm. Never had a day over 95 degrees. My average temperature was probably 78 to 82 degrees. Uh, it was it was a very summer, and I still I you know I, I remember like it was yesterday. So it was it was nice. Uh, I don't know if you've got the picture of my grass from the aerial view of about mid. That was that was the grass uh, October of uh, 2019. So that was a year before. So it was it wasn't bad grass, but it just so wasn't. This this was the, the before all the the glyphosate. Yeah, it was that was the, about October of the year before. Okay. So, Okay. To so this a month um, in. And th yeah, this is a month in. Uh, this is probably around the eleventh mm. of November, I would think. And and so, when when did you say this picture was taken? This picture was taken mid November, around maybe the twentieth. Oh damn! Look at that. Yeah! Wow. That's pretty good. I don't so know no, if I showed you the picture of the house. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, uh, that's, I don't know if you had the picture of the house on the, on like the front view of that early, but yeah, I had a buddy that's got a drone. So he, uh, he took some pictures for me. Well, you, you can see us in the driveway. That was pro that was probably yeah. the, the same time frame as what that last picture was the year before. Cause that this was, so this might've been around November, uh, early November, maybe late October. But uh, I mean, I had some nuts edge and I had some uh, crabgrass in there, but I just I didn't have any didn't use any pre-emergence, any any herbicides, anything like that on it at all that year. So I went out there That's and I picked good. the crabgrass. I picked picked the nuts picked the nuts edge. Um, I, I like I've always told my like I told my friends and coworkers I said I haven't done too many things right in my life, but this grass. Is one of the few ones that I actually did good. So yeah, yeah, it looks I was, good. I was yeah, so nervous. Did. I was so nervous about this grass because I I must have called in twice on Matt's uh, little Q and A show about uh, lawn fungus diseases, and he goes, he goes, if I if I've seen you know so many grass that got wiped out by lawn disease, I'd probably be two. So I I that kind of, that made me you know feel a little bit better. But I don't know yeah, when this picture I mean, was it's... labeled. This one. That's probably uh, you're probably. This one says November, uh, like right okay, before so Thanksgiving. Okay, so that's middle of November. Yeah, that's okay. that's end of November right there. So you can see the little boulevard hmm. section is filled in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, uh, I I I'm I'm super impressed. I I get my neighbors across the street. They always say, Matt, your yard looks so nice. It looks so nice, and it makes me feel good. So um, that was. That was whenever I was telling you about the uh, uh, the week of the my daughter's graduation party. I must have mowed that five days in a row that direction just so I could have some nice lines going in there for a party. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my! And then actually, uh, actually the day, and that's probably at about two two and a half, two and three quarters inch cut. It's on the middle section on my mm -hmm. Toro. So, um, then that that next day I actually cut straight up. If you look on the right hand side, uh, I, I cut up on that section there. I, it's not on that picture, but I cut like the vertical lines. So you actually see two, uh -huh. two cuts of lines and two sections of the grass. At one point, I was just getting so bored of what I was going to, you know, how I was going to mow my stripes. So I think I mowed in an S, you know, I think I mowed in a V. <laughs> uh, I mowed a couple of times with an X, you know, I just got a lot of, a lot of extra time. So. Almost, only so much you can do with two thousand square feet, right? You gotta, you gotta change it up a little bit. You gotta keep it interesting. And I, and I, I, I did take care of the the, uh, the the side and the backyard, but actually the backyard was really looking good until, like I said, my daughter's graduation party. Excuse me. Uh, it got mm -hmm. eighty five to ninety eight degrees for like two weeks and no rain, and whatever grass that grew in the spring and whatever grass that grew in the in the fall of last year like died out that's that's the day before the graduation party and if i went out there now and showed you a picture you wouldn't even recognize it so hmm. that um let me see I'm trying to think okay so the the left picture of that when i moved into that house so starting being the far you know the farthest tree and all the way back was nothing but creeping charlie 
I mean, when I mowed, I mowed creeping Charlie and maybe 5% grass. I got out my, because I didn't know anything about lawn care. I didn't know what it was. So I got out my tiller and I tilled that whole section up of, my, of that left-hand side with the tiller in two days. Uh, planted grass seed. And after all that hard work, I planted grass seed. We got five inches of rain in two days. So that basically wiped out that uh, grass growth that fall. So I did the next next fall, and we didn't get as much rain, but we did get like two or three inches of rain in, in about four or five days of period. It grew back, and then I ended up putting some uh, sunshade mix on there this fall, and it finally took in. Now on the right-hand side, I don't know if you could tell, but there's a little patch there. It's like, it must be like fine fescue or something or, or bent grass or something, but it just, it's so fine. It doesn't stand up. And I don't know. I've, I've never known what it is, but I was thinking about making that my side yard project by my neighbor who has the fence, has a bunch of organic uh, uh, vegetables in his garden on the other side. He's worried about, you know, that hurting his vegetation. So I'm like, I'm just going to let it go. I'm, it's not worth it. I'm just going to mow it. Wait. It actually, it, it looks nice on that right-hand side. So that hasn't changed. Wait, what is it? That's always been there. I've never done anything on that at all. Wow. Oh, okay. Sorry, so he he thinks, uh, you're fine. No, no, no. This is all good info. This is, uh, first of all, thank you for your dedication. I mean, the people that would take, uh, you know, basically paternity leave to take care of their new new seedlings right <laughs> like they're like maybe not their first or second born child but you know at least later on like a like a second wife or something third. like that you know third whatever uh you know that's that's admirable uh and and sometimes that's what it takes is that you know people will fail in these projects and I, you know i know i i clean up after this you know on a professional basis i darn, darn sure know that ray does where you know people plant this stuff and expect magic to happen right ray right right but uh it is all in how you maintain it how you manage it and even before talking about maintenance and management it comes down to making the right kind of turf grass choices for example because matt you said something about planting zoysia or having zoysia somewhere in the yard right uh, yeah, like if I don't know if he can show the front part of my yard. Um, and then on that one side, there's little bits of uh, zoysia grass. That was okay. all basically uh, zoysia. It was like, um, well, I, I have a that uh, lawn identification app, and it said it was buffalo grass, to be honest. So I emailed no. Matt one day, and I said, how can I get rid of this? This was two years ago. How can I get rid of this? And I don't know what he was all... I can't remember what he was all trying to say to use, but I, um, so I looked up the product mm -hmm. and uh, I, so then I'm like, I don't know. So I talked to my dad, that's when I talked to my dad. And um, so I made the decisive effort just to, you know, with that. And I, you know, I saw five different, 10 different types of greens in my grass, you know, some yellow, some light green, some dark green. Now it's sure. all the same color green. <laughs> Yeah, now so, now it's all the now now it's all uniform, and now it's of a grass species that is appropriate for conditions and area. Because here's what I know about zoysia: it probably looks horrible once it gets cool. It's oh, brown. It, it, it was yeah. brown until mid-May. Exactly. May. It was brown. Exactly. Exactly, and uh, my only cautionary tale about this is because you had it before Matt be prepared to deal with it coming back up and here and here's why Zoisha lives as both seeds and as rhizomes that are extremely deep in the soil and they don't necessarily come back up the first year or two after a renovation they may come up on years three and four okay see i was going to yeah, ask about that right yeah you know, and that and and you're right i mean this is like the honeymoon period because i'll tell you this is that 
the people that that don't commit the time effort and the pre-planning right to get yourself in position to grow in a lawn like this and do it as successfully as you did or this time frame that you did it in usually are so far behind the eight ball they're just like oh the whole thing's screwed and whatever right well you mm -hmm. rode the razor's edge right you rode the wave and you surfed it all the way into shore and now hey okay you've got a lawn and now you're maintaining it and it looks like you're doing a bang up job and now that same level of of thought and ocd and uh anxiety riddled decisions you know are now before you for okay now we've we've done really the hard part right now what do we do in terms of maintaining right. it and what are the problems that we can foresee and plan for so this was that's, one thing i was going to ask that's my main issue yeah i was going to ask this of ray and this is sort of serve serve that same purpose so you you mentioned like in that decision making process you know um matt martin said hey you know if you want to take zoysia out of tall fescue or at least clean up the zoysia in your cool season do this this and this and this and you came to the fork in the road right and what's the old yogi bear saying come to the fork in the road you take it well you ended up going down towards glyphosate nuke it rental it. and i think that was, that was a fantastic choice my friend fantastic choice uh, and those people would not have the cojones to do what you did but you stood in there with your onions you held them with both hands and you swung for the fences and i'm proud of you now on the let's just say you went the other direction ray you're much more well versed in this so i'm going to let you answer this if you had a situation where somebody said hey i can't i won't i don't want to whatever i need to take this mm -hmm. zoysia out of my cool season what is the protocol in the timing right the products and general rates and timing to get that done effectively. And I'm sure it's probably not a one year process. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's not a one, in one year process. And what you're looking at, if you want to disadvantage Zoisha in say, turf type tall fescue or KBG or, or even rye is you're looking at using, believe it or not, tenacity and you start doing that to the grass in late summer while it's still green, but uh, about two months before actual fall and winter when it goes dormant brown. And in the winter or late fall, you also apply the full rate of this other herbicide called Prograss or Estofumisate. And the reason why you do that is because on the tenacity label, it says do not apply to zoysia unless removal or severe injury is tolerable. And on the ethofumisate labels, it says do not apply to zoysia because severe injury will result. So what does that mean to you, Ryan? I know what it means to me. Yeah, <laughs> that means if you don't severe want injury you don't when they're talking about. Apply it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually when we talk about severe injury on a label, they're they're trying to cover their butt by not saying, "Hey, we're gonna nuke this gonna kill it. without <laughs> nuking it." Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I found I found the email that Matt sent me, and he says, "Looks like Bermuda," uh -huh. and he goes, "Blue Zop, Blue Aza Pop." Then mm -hmm. yes. the top and, over the top mm -hmm. and top mm -hmm. from a zone you know, the best that's depending on the type, so that's yep. yeah yeah so pilot pilot yep. yep and i mean no, you can do that right i mean with those both being so for the folks listening at home uh, pilex and tenacity are both in the same chemical family right and in the same mode of action the way they work right so ray quickly Two a two part question. Explain really quickly how the HPPD inhibitors work, right? And then mm -hmm. those that's what Pilex and uh, Tenacity are. And then secondarily, is there an advantage of one over the other, specifically for removing zoysia out of cool season? This is just zoysia out of cool season. Okay. Or Bermuda, first I guess. of all, go ahead. Oh, first first of all, with the uh, your HPPD inhibitors, which are the tenacity, you know, mesotrione and the topramazone, which would be the pilex, what that does is that goes into 
the targeted plant and it keeps the plant from being able to synthesize carotene and carotene is what prevents chlorophyll from being destroyed by uv radiation and so what that means is that when if you cannot maintain chlorophyll in a leaf you get that bleaching out paper white effect in the weed okay but here are the differences you know in terms of you know chemical activity between say mesotrione and topramazone mesotrione is a lot more persistent in the soil versus topramazone however if i had to compare you know biological activity overall on you know say mesotrione versus topramazone what clues me in on that is for example normal usage rates of each product like your syngenta tenacity calls for four ounces of the formulated chemical per acre whereas your pilex starts to become effective at rates as low as a quarter of an ounce per acre so many orders of you know magnitude more powerful <laughs> okay and, and definitely yeah so then it, tell me in in this case right so you know matt said to pramazone and he was thinking it was bermuda which obviously pilex to pramazone is going to be the first choice right over tenacity so why in that case is to pramazone the best choice if we're facing bermuda Right. And then why is tenacity the best choice if we're facing zoysia? And this is both trying to selectively remove it from a cool season stand. Okay. The reason why I prefer the tenacity is because I've had an opportunity to use both tenacity and pilex because I actually use both of those herbicides here in Hawaii. And what happens is because the tenacity is a lot more persistent in the soil, you get prolonged effect on your zoysia. Whereas mm. with your, because in actual practice, the other program that can be used, but this gets rather expensive is Ryan, imagine applying the equivalent of an ounce and a half of Pilex per acre mm -hmm. and doing that three or four times. That's actually yeah, BASF's so... protocol for suppressing zoysia in a cool season lawn. Yeah, so for I actually those ended of up you did buying some Pilex. Did you, you did really? do it, did you man. Buy a little four ounce bottle, the little four ounce I bottle? I didn't know. I... No, I bought it on the lawn car, the lawn care form. I bought oh, okay, remember, you, split. you know those like little Jack Daniel bottles. It was like one ounce. Yes. I think it cost yeah. me like sixty bucks. Sixty bucks mm -hmm. for an ounce. Oh, when wow. I'm buying, you know, thirty-two ounce bottles of herbicides for forty dollars, um, I end up because I was going to do it. I, I mean, I was committed, and um, it's actually pre that's, that's actually a pretty thought. good deal because well, right now it's it's about seventy bucks. It's about seventy bucks an ounce. Or eighty four hundred dollars a gallon for uh, Pilex for those of you counting at home. So sixty dollars for a little airline <laughs> bottle, not too, not too bad, right? And it was a Jack yeah. Daniels bottle so, too. So, um, well, there you go. You know, you I can, thought it was uh, kind of you know, it can be like that, you know. Yeah, yeah you yeah, know, you it's can, kind of cool you know, when you when you when you're all done. You know, you uh, you put some water in there and you put the highlighter in there and put the black light up like you're in college again and stick it up in your room and you know see if you can do that trick. It's uh like decorating your frat house. So, Somebody will know what I mean. Well, then I, 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 <laughs> I, I know what you mean. So then what I did was I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to torch it all. And I resold it. So I just sold it again. So I'm, I, I didn't even open it. So I just, I think I, I maybe lost $5 on shipping or something like that. But yeah, I just like, I didn't even use it. So 
because uh, best Matt, not to use it. Is Matt, what I actually would have told you had you talked to me or asked me about this wall, you know, starting your endeavor, it is very routine for me to go into somebody's property. Property. Okay. It is very routine for me to go into somebody's property when they do have zoisha that is undesired and drop mm -hmm. pilex and roundup on that entire yard and do it three times. And do you know why I do that? It's because with glyphosate alone, I have seen zoisha come back from the dead from glyphosate. I've seen it happen. You're not gonna make me sleep for the night. No, I, I, I'm just uh, that. That's basically oh, my I job. Know. Is that everyone that talks to me loses whatever sense of security they have because uh, I guess I've seen the horror stories where they swear they had it killed off, but. Uh, Whatever they were supposed to have killed off is now back two or three years later. I've seen it happen. You can't burn it off again. You got to deal with the problem at that point. So. Yeah, then, then that's a, a matter of re remedial work where you're, uh, you know, you, 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 you burnt your one reno that you're allowed to do because I know from a lot of the guys... Uh, you know, listening, I think they're allowed one renovation, I think, every five to ten years. After that, your you know, their other half says, uh, absolutely not, dear. You just did that a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, well, that's not, that's so, not know, an issue here, so. Um. Yeah, yeah, but then I'm just saying that... Uh, you know, you just, uh, I would have probably have told you keep to have kept that little bottle of Pilex around for if and when that Zoisha were to come back because I don't ever assume that Zoisha is dead. I don't ever make that assumption. Um, I did spray, I did spray some tenacity uh, and I missed mistook the uh, label instruction or the label rates and I might have mm -hmm. sprayed a little too heavy because I had frosted blonde grass in three days so and um, I don't know I, I I have considered that coming back up and I and I it wasn't a big area of the grass it was just like I said in the right right in front of the house it was just that area and then it's more mm -hmm. uh, more or less on the back side of my yard um, I mm -hmm. guess I can uh, you know, do both, but uh, the main reason I did the reno is I had, like I said, I had five to 10 different colors of greens in my yard. I, I had, you know, bunched fescue in one area. I had, you know, I don't, I, at that point, I probably couldn't tell you what fescue versus bluegrass versus uh, um, rye looked like. So um, I knew what tall turf fescue and bluegrass looked like because I watched uh, Pete Denny's videos all the time, and I saw it. Um, but mm -hmm. he's he's more of a straight uh, fescue person. But um, and to be honest, I can't. I mean, there's some there's some differences in the leaf blades, you know, width and stuff like that. But not what I was dealing with. I I, I bet you had my yard was that Kentucky 31. Uh, yes, it was just in bunches. It was just bunchy so, and hideous looking. So. Yeah, that, that's a justification yes. is to try to get a uniform or relatively uniform color and texture overall. And, you know, that is a perfectly justifiable reason. And, of course, uh, my concern is always when somebody has warm season contamination in their cool season, that's going to be the first to go brown in the fall and the last to come back up uh Come springtime, and so in the meantime, you have to explain these dead patches, you know, mm -hmm. when everything else is green around it. I, I had never really dealt with uh, warm season grasses before. Um, 
my dad always had, you know, uh, Kentucky blue or, or all turf fescue or ryegrass in his grass. And he never really had that. And so now I, I, I had to deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. I've never had a house with a tree in it. Now I've got nine oak trees in the backyard, which I can't get grass to grow. Um, I've got a couple of trees <laughs> on one side. There, yeah, there's my, there's my graveyard. Yeah, That's about six right. or seven yards of dirt that I've, you know, I dumped out in the backyard. I, that's about what the grass looks like now. It's just really thin. Like I said, it got hit with 80 to 95 degree temperatures for two weeks with no rain. So that'll kill out some mm -hmm. new grass. And I don't really don't, I, I really don't irrigate that backyard. Um, I really don't irrigate the front yard all that much unless I'm applying some kind of a fertilizer or, or biostimulant, you know, that I need to water in or something like that. But um, I, I have to joke because I was telling my friend this. I said, I bought that hose link hose, you know, the hose link. I bought that mm -hmm. last Thursday. Mm -hmm. And we've got six inches of rain. I still haven't used it yet. I used it the other day to fill up my two gallon sprayer. That's the only time I've used it in the last 10 days. <laughs> so, that is funny. That is funny. <laughs> Did you want? Did you wash your car right? I mean, that thing is awesome. Too? I can I can reach out all the way across this, the, almost to the other side of the street with that thing. So, and it comes right <laughs> back in. I, and but I haven't been able to use it yet. So, I mean, I I I, I rolled it out two feet to fill up my sprayer, and that was it. Like one of these days, I get to use <laughs> it. For, they're supposed to be calling from some rain this weekend. It's spotty, but you never know. I'm not too worried. Hopefully we just got six inches yourself. of rain, so I think we're fine. Hey, yeah. I've, I've, I'm done jinxing myself, but uh, oh, yeah, somebody said they want to hear about that drag. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a nice looking though. That's yeah, that's um, a beautiful drag, man. A, oh man, my dad had a chain link fence at his house, and I said, "Hey, are you using this?" And I, he goes, "No." And I go, "Why?" He goes, "I want to make a, I want to spread out some dirt in my yard." He goes, "Take it." So I put some two by fours and put a chain that I had much in use the neighbor's lawnmower and uh J -Pink. I felt like i was a groundskeeper for about 20 minutes can we get a can we get a side by side of that and then brian jones's uh palette with the stump on it because this is <laughs> this to me this is silver metal i want to say like you, you you try really hard and i'm proud of you but see brian go brian jones who was on this show maybe a couple months ago he had the best drag ever I think so. I had to delete all the photos he sent me because I was running out of uh, hard drive space. That's he because sent I sent him like hundred photos. photos. Yeah, he sent. Well, no, I think Brian sent me more. Shot or see Brian go sent me more than than you did. He sent me a lot. Really? I think he had to <laughs> ship me a, a terabyte hard drive just to get me all the photos. <laughs> um, I do. I do do some work with uh, pallets. I never thought about that. I mean, my job. I. I. Uh, well. I'm gonna, can I do a side note real quick? I'm gonna turn this thing around and yeah, you Luke. guys will enjoy this. This is, speaking of pallets, this is gonna be the, the gold medal right here. Oh, we're, oh I'm sorry. I'm, all right, there we go. That whole wall is done with pallets. Wow, oh. nice. I took, nice. I took there you go. Uh, probably 20 pallet pieces or pallet woods and cut out the top and stained them, about uh, three different kinds of stain. And I nailed them up to the wall. I don't know if that. Oh, that is, that is beautiful. Hey, pallet good. paneling, Pad, pallet paneling, yeah, that's, right that's, there. That's my pallet wall room. So yeah, that's. There's a guy yeah, I worked with way back when that that builds furniture and all sorts of stuff just out of pallets and makes some serious side hustle money doing it. People eat that stuff up. So. Maybe you ought to, you know, you can uh, go do walls <laughs> and stuff like that if, if uh, to support your lawn and, habit, you know. <laughs> well, I, I bought one of those Blackstone griddles and I and I got tired of going out and inside and out, inside and out. So I got a pallet and I made a little food prep table in my garage. So now I got that out there so I don't have to worry about it. So, hey, that's free so, wood. Uh, Without giving away, you know, too much and, and trying to dox yourself or anything, what do you do for a living? Just curious. <laughs> I'm a state worker. Okay. Um, I uh, I work for the information technology for the Secretary of State. Oh um, my goodness, an IT I, guy. How do I know? 
J Pink. Uh, I, I work I work seven I work seven twelve hour days, um, and then I'm off a week. Oh gosh! And so basically, I work I have twenty six weeks vacation a year without taking any time. That's wild. So wow. when I take off when I take off a work week, I take off ten days, so I'm off the off week. Then I'm off my work week. And then I'm off the off week. So when I take off one week, I'm off for three weeks. <laughs> So there, there, you know, I play, I play innovation around that. So that's, uh, that is some successful engineering of the, uh, the PTO schedule, sir. And I'm even more in awe of, of how you <laughs> this out. So kudos to you. So uh, the, I didn't get to hear this and I par- apologize. I had to step away for a second, but the backyard, the leveling, was it just real rough and bumpy, you know, from, oh yeah. So, so, or... so, um, I got, you know, since I had this new grass, it kind of was like just bogging down my little lawnmower that I had for the last 10 years. So I'm like, you know what? I got a nice new lawn. I want a nice new lawnmower. So I went out and bought one of the Toro uh, personal pace uh, recyclers, not the big ones, but just the regular recycler. And I was mowing my backyard and this, and the thing would just, you know, almost die, you know, cause the gas would not like, um, it was almost like it was, it wasn't, catching the gas because it was bouncing and sloshing around all the time. So I'm like, well, I, well, I guess I'll just try to level it out. And for the most part, it it has run away at that problem. But then I come across with, so then I didn't put any uh, pre, uh, pre-emergent on the front yard. So I didn't put any pre-emergent on the backyard, uh, mm. you know, in, in line of tenacity. So when I came across the spring, I had hen bit, I had chickweed, I had, uh, you know, whatever kind of hardy weed he had back there. And um, so I ended up buying some, uh, uh, I think it was speed zone or T, no, T-zone. Yeah. And I did two T-zone. blanket applications. T-zone, I did one black blanket application, then I did a semi-blanket application on just some of the spots that I didn't get. And uh, it pretty much killed everything that was back there. So um, that's the one thing I wish I would have done was maybe put some pre-emergent down, but I didn't expect that to come back. But then again, I was dealing with, with what, six uh, yards or six tons of uh, backfill that was probably from a river. So who knows what was back there. But they delivered oh, yeah. to my house. I just had to distribute it. So Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky you. So now, I guess you know, I, I, it's, it's like it's like I almost go to work to to relax. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that yeah, that does kind of seem <laughs> true. That you yeah, you know what? I'm 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 really burnt out at home. I'm gonna go do seven twelves, and I'll be back home next week. <laughs> God, yeah, that hey, like I said, more power to you, and that's that that's awesome though that that works out, and that's uh, that's a pretty cherry schedules to have especially if you're if you're into lawn care because you can you know even on the off weeks you can sort of plan out that that's sort of a light week where maybe you just mow a couple times or something like that and just do the basics right and then you pour it on uh in those off weeks so that's that's pretty nice compared to you know some people really fight that um that battle of being able to do stuff when they want to when they need to and then when the weather allows them to and you've got certainly you can look at a whole week ahead and just be like, well, it looks like Wednesday is the best day. So this is when I'm going to spray or fur or mow or whatever. And that that's, that's huge to be able to sort of pick and choose your schedule. Um, I can't, I can't say enough about that. I know that a lot of times I talk to people, you know, in the home lawn, the DIY side, and they're like, listen, like Saturday is the only day I can do this. And I know it's going to be hot or dry or this or that. And it's just like, I got to pull the trigger, right? I have to do this because this is literally my only opportunity. And so I get that. And, you know, that's, that's lawn care too. You know, if you're a pro and you're watching this, you know, the same thing is like, sometimes you got to be in out, out there and doing stuff in conditions that aren't necessarily suitable, right? That you would like to have in an ideal world, but you have to get stuff done. You have to keep moving forward. Um, you know, to get all those, those properties done and things like that. So definitely an advantage for you uh, in that regard. I think that's, that's a really, really good thing. So, so on this backyard, you've got things leveled up. Generally speaking, I mean, is there any plans back there to do 
more or is it pretty much set at this point or what? I, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much, I don't like that's, that was two weeks ago. Uh, well, no, good. yeah. About, you know, about a month ago, that's, that's what it was. And I don't have the greatest grass back there, um, but it it's does. Okay. It, it, yeah, it's okay. And I don't know what's what what is that kind of grass there just on the very bottom of that photo? It almost looks some it's of those grass seeds you, you know, get. What is it? What is it? What kind of texture does it have? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, it's well, it almost reminds me of uh, poa, but I really haven't had too much poa in the yard. It almost looks like very cheap fescue, to be honest. It looks like it doesn't triv. have deeper breed. Really? Looks like poetry. Uh, it, 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 poetry it's not Alice, there anymore. Which is yes. really gross. Oh, what'd you it, do? It's yeah, not it there anymore. So. Oh, okay. What happened to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not much grass back there anymore, but um, just because, like I said, it got really hot in dry conditions. Um, and then, like I said, there's. Oh, uh, it bounced back. It, there, yeah, there's. Um, yeah, there's the, the right hand side is the side that I was going to do the renovation on. Um, so there's a couple spots that in the, in the winter time, you can see that there's actually still some zoysia there. The left-hand side is where the, the tripping Charlie was. So basically I tilled that all up, but that's all it's, I, I'm, I'm satisfied because I, like I said, I, there's on average, there's probably eight trees that cover my yard, 10 trees altogether. And like I said, I've never had a house that, 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 that had a tree in it. So I, you know, I, I emailed Matt and I said, how can I get grass to grow in the shade? He goes, luck in our prayer. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> a bad storm comes through and knocks down several low hanging limbs. That's always a good, uh, a good thing to hope for. Right? Well, I did, I did get the trees trimmed two years ago. Um, uh -huh. I don't really want to cut the shade because that two of those trees cover that the deck. And when you're sitting out there, it's, you know, you got shade and it actually, the shade is, hits the south side of the house there. So uh, it's good on that end, um, but I, hey, if grass is growing in there and it's green, yeah, I'm good. I would suspect that in the foreground of the picture, the one the grass that you were concerned with and asking about right there, I would suspect that that's Poa trivialis, which is rough bluegrass, and you know there is nothing that you can really do to selectively take that out. Um, and yeah, it's a tough one to deal with. So if you do notice that it goes dormant here, you know, because it hasn't been watered and things like that, that's a, a very clear sign that it probably is Boa trivialis because uh, okay. it is notorious for looking like this, like kind of real light green stemmy, almost like that real coarse leaf texture like you would see on a, on a cheap tall fescue or an older tall fescue. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden like. you get into the summer heat and it just craps out and it goes dormant. And it'll stay that way until about, you know, maybe Labor Day-ish. And then come back with a vengeance and continue to push out and grow because it grows uh, underground as well with rhizomes, right? So just like Kentucky bluegrass is a sod form of this stuff is too. And so it's another uh, facet of it that makes it even more difficult to control because you have very limited, if no, ability to control it selectively. And it's still pushing out and growing and spreading on you um with every successive year so even though it decides to take a crap in the summertime and you know not do much and be dormant and everything like that it's a, a hardy hardy plant in the spring and in the fall and, and spreading those rhizomes so you know if you ever and do it's, and it's back in the back so here. oh yeah yeah i'm not you know and i'm not saying that this is something that's worth going after if it was in the front yard and you know you saw things like this then we would talk about different strategies that you could do to try and tame it a little bit, if not take it out, which would be with a non-selective like glyphosate, but um, it, it, it being where it's at, it's not that big of a problem. I think the front, uh, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, what your uh, thoughts are as far as a manager strategy going forward on the front, you know, so now it's, you know, almost a year old and, you know, I guess, what are you doing right now that you feel like is working? Um, what are you not sure is working, but you're still doing it? And then lastly, what are you, what are you afraid of that might happen? And what are you trying to, you know, batten down the hatches Boy. for in case it would? 
All right, so the first question, um, what am I using or what am I doing that's working? Um, I'm applying, right now, I'm not applying any fertilizer other than a uh, 700, uh, like a Lesco uh, for, um, liquid fertilizer with some iron in it. Um, I usually maybe apply six to nine ounces per thousand just with my backpack sprayer, then I let it sit for a couple hours and I spray it in. That's really all I've done to the front other than I apply some Biostim products. Um, I think the last fertilizer I put on was about a week before Memorial Day. I put some uh, 14, 25, six or something like that. Basically a starter fertilizer to kind of mm -hmm. promote uh, uh, some growth based on my soil test because I was really low on the potassium. Uh, I think that's the potassium, yeah. FPK. Okay. Um, I was low on that. Uh, so I went out and bought some starter fertilizer from a local turf place around here. Um, and that's, it's been, it's been going good. It's, uh, uh, as far as what hasn't worked, I really haven't seen anything that hasn't worked. Um, sometimes I wish it would get a little greener. Um, but as far as, uh, I mean, it's, it's summertime. It's like I said, until the last week, we probably had an inch rain in the last month. Um, mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I don't water it other than I watered it the other day when I put a uh, uh, insecticide and fungicide in. Um, I watered it about maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes on each segment just to kind of water that stuff in. Um, but, uh, and, and what was, I forget what the last question you said was, uh, uh, like moving oh, forward or something. What do you? What do you know? You're looking ahead. You're looking ahead, and like you said, I you know I I think of of all the folks that we've talked to in the you know four or so months we've been doing this show, I feel like you were probably one of the more thoughtful people in terms of, hey, I've got to get this right, and I'm going to pull out all the stops, you know, to to make sure that I have success. So in thinking ahead, right, I want to sustain that ex that success, right? Well, one of the so things that anything... one of the things that yeah. Um, one of the things I, I, I've been doing more lately and I've noticed uh, is I mow it about every three days. Um, mainly the, the front side, like I said, the backyard doesn't get much sun, so it doesn't grow as fast as the side in the front. So I mow that probably every three days. Um, I've noticed that that has really kind of thickened it up. Um, other things that I liked that I would like to do is uh, you know, some of the bare spots, that's like I said in, in the pre-show, I there's a, a couple spots that are just bare right now. So I'm going to rough those up, you know, mid-August probably, put some seed down that I still have and uh, uh, water those. And hopefully we've got some grass growing there. But as far as uh, I'm always looking to, to work on the backyard, um, I think the front yard, the side yard is, is um, on its own for right now. Uh, just just your basic main maintenance and keeping up with the front and the side. The front, I feel, I'm, I don't want to take my foot off the gas pedal, but I don't want to put it on cruise control and, and lose what I've got uh, to either fungus or, you know, the returning of the zoysia or, or whatnot. Um, that's always in the back side of my head. Uh, but no, and I think um, yeah, that's that's definitely something to consider. What about disease and things like that? Have you noticed anything, you know, either prior? I've to never seen any disease in my yard. No, no, really. Hmm. Okay. Not well. Not that I've not that I you know, not that I saw a lot of spots. ID'd. Right. Yeah. I got. Um, you. There was a couple spots in my front yard that I just saw in the last week or so that like brown spots. I don't know if it was. Uh, now I do have a dog, so I. You know, she goes in the front yard when we go on walks, but there was two like really brown spots that I, you know, I picked at them and they basically just pulled right up. And I didn't know if that was, uh, and they were probably about the size of a baseball if you were to cut a baseball in half. Um, so they weren't really noticeable when I pulled them out. So you couldn't see a lot of soil. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it was one of those things where I was thinking about buying one of those little pluggers and just, Going in an area of my grass and you know, kind of doing the whole uh, 
plug it and see if it spread. Uh, but yeah, I don't and, know. I, and it, no, no, no. Those are those are good things to think about and good thoughts. I like where your head's at, and I think the other thing to consider there too. So you have tall fescue, and it's a bunch type grass. So whereas you know Kentucky bluegrass will spread underground through rhizomes or um, you know Bermuda grass, a warm season grass will spread through stolons over the top of the soil and rhizomes down below. Tall fescue is what we call a bunch type grass, which means one seed equals one plant. So even the ones that are advertised as, you know, um, excessive tillering or spreading or uh, rhizomatous, eh, eh. It's, a, it, it's a stretch to say, um, you know, that would be like me calling myself husky instead of flat, right? So it's a very pleasurable and nice way to say it. Makes me feel good about myself, but it does nobody any favors. So um, here you go, Ryan. That, I finally Man, found it. Oh, you found look one. You found one. Look at that. First of all, I, I want to give credit to our silver medalist here. Um, <laughs> you know, Matt, I think, I think it's a great use of the two by four. You know, probably now or at least three months ago, there's like $18 worth of lumber on that MF. -er. So I was going to say, you know, that really lawnmower is that. Yeah. That, you know, you, that, the sled's more, more worth than the, the lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty probably much. Could have I got, mean, that... Probably could have got like. And, you know, it just made me think about it metal. because I gave this to a friend of mine uh, in, in, in October of last year. I haven't seen her back. So I'm like, and that's highway robbery. You got to start taking deposits on that thing, man. Like, I'm going to need your license or <laughs> keys or, you know, something here. Credit and, card uh, number A. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. Meet your credit card, please. Exactly. <laughs> so on the right, if, you, if you're not a loyal, and I do mean loyal, uh, you know, not just subscriber, but a member of the Grass Factor channel, which you can do if you just slide right on down at the bottom of this video feed of our beautiful faces. Click on the membership options and go ahead and join because we will have uh, special access for you tonight and tonight only for the after show, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. It's fun. It's probably going to get a little rowdy tonight mm -hmm. because, well, um, I, I've lost count of how many beers are on my desk right now, but. Ray is probably on his third Italian <laughs> roast coffee, so it's about to get. Out. Anyhow, well, I've got my, I, I've got my uh, natural light going. So, natural, I've got the Keystone here as always, boys. <laughs> Ray, I can't see your cup. I don't know what's in there. I'm not even sure if you're wearing clothes at this point, but I do wish you the best if I can cheer you right now. So, um, with that being said, you know I think it's. <sighs> It's an interesting situation where, you know, we, we always talk about um, what your problems are because so often we see people do these projects and then kind of get left uh, left on an island of, okay, hey, you know, you had all these good seating videos and everything like that. And I think Ryan and those guys do a great job of the aftercare stuff. But I see people lose interest. I don't see that happening with you. Like you seem very invested in this, right? And so for the disease Commitment. thing... I I yeah. think that's an important thing that you want to stay up and, and really read up on, um, you know, brown patch and what might happen to your tall fescue and getting back to the plugging thing there is, you know, one seed equals one plant. So you're not going to be able to, you can use those plugs effectively to fill spots, but just understand that that spot is well, all that will be filled, right? You're not going to get much, if any, of that lateral spread on that stuff to the extent that you could put you know, uh, a two inch plug in a, um, you know, 12 square inch void and expect it to fill all the way in. Now that said, and that, and that was, an... go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I, I was, that was part of my thought process on that because, you know, this is 85% tall fescue. So for every three inch uh, square, you know, thing that I'm going to be flagging out, you know, 15% of that's only bluegrass. So it's you know it's not it's not going to spread if I if I now if I had a whole yard of just Kentucky bluegrass like what uh, the grass that he did on his yeah that you can plug and play with that all day long. Well, and and that might be something too to consider. I mean, I do I do like the um, the predominantly tall fescue with some uh, Kentucky bluegrass uh, mixtures. I think there's some there's some validity there. 
And I think too that you you probably will see more of those that contain even more Kentucky bluegrass, right? And so, uh, you know, even if you see on a sod farm, you know, here in Ohio, and I know it's the same throughout the Midwest, even out to a Jew in Illinois, is that tall fescue sod is actually a pretty uh, common thing that you'll see. And the way that they do that is they'll incorporate up to, and they can only include up to 10% Kentucky bluegrass in there to help it knit together. Now, they'll use other tricks like putting netting in there on the ground when they seed into it to give it um, sod strength as they harvest. But from a... Um, you know, a pure mixture of seed standpoint, I would be interested to see, you know, even at 15 or 20% Kentucky bluegrass in your case is go ahead and drop those plugs in and see what happens. Right. I mean, what's, what's the worst that happens, right? That it doesn't spread and that you either need to scratch some areas up, you need to add some more plugs, whatever the case might be, but I'd be interested to see, okay, Hey, how much and how hard can we push a mixture that's you know roughly a year old and it's still hungry and wants to grow and if if we do push it at the right time so i wouldn't do those plugs like necessarily in the next four weeks and expect to see huge massive results but <laughs> i would say you know anytime after early august late august yeah full send you know layer the enticer with a uh, snowmobile just gonna send it <laughs> right there so that is what I would do if I were you, is just see. So uh, we've got, uh, you did send soil tests, didn't you? Yes, yeah, I've got some. Uh, here's the one Ooh. from this year. Ooh. Mm. Ah. Where did wow. you do this at? Did this, come out, did this come out on a dot matrix printer? <laughs> I think we're talking about that. I said, I think this is free, free, uh, free windows. Hopefully they hopefully they they crinkled up the sides and ripped those off and hopefully you didn't run their those, sorry those asses dirt, out of ribbon. They, what do they call that know? decal? They call that decalate, right? Decalate, something like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> you're going deep. No, this came on. Uh, I... <laughs> do we ha can we get some support? You know what would it take? What, what do you think if I call? You know, I, I have no idea. You and Jay Pink, I know you're in IT. That's all I know. Please forgive me, but. If I call uh, the IT desk, can you guys can right you guys show the head. first soil? My yeah, can you show the first soil test. The, there, there's yeah. this is the soil test that I had done That's in June, cool. I believe. Of now, if you look at the uh, the potassium and the the the, the phosphorus, no, yes, the potassium was that was high on, and I didn't. And here's another uh, tidbit I, I was telling him during the pre-show. I never used any kind of uh, fertilizer other than straight nitrogen. Um, I didn't use any pre-emergent. Oh. I didn't use any post-emergent. I didn't use anything but ammonium sulfate and uh, green punch 1801 and uh, the remnants of my second to last bag of uh, carbon X. That's all I used on fertilizer. I didn't use any starter fertilizer because uh, that was one of the things I called into uh, the mat was i'm like i have an abundance of uh potassium he, and he goes wow you are <laughs> he goes no you probably don't need any uh starter fertilizer so i didn't put any starter fertilizer down and i had oh you saw that one picture of september as a result and uh the iron he said was good but um and i think i i i think this was the first soil test that i had and ray was on the show too Right, Ray, I, I believe Ray was Ray was on the show, yeah, and uh, he's because he had problems bringing the soil test picture up. Um, the only thing I really don't understand is the carbon exchange capacity, and then the the um, the saturation is it the component I can't hardly read that. My eyes are not great. That, those are the only part parts that I don't understand on this whole um, whole soil test. So if you guys can explain that and the buffer pH versus the soil pH. So I'll, I'll let you guys have the floor. Um, so this was in June right. before I did the, the renovation. I had a really awesome analogy for cation exchange capacity that I told somebody on this show a while back and I cannot remember it, but um, basically just think of it as a place to put your stuff in the soil, right? So on the soil colloid, right? And the ability for 
cations, right? So we're looking at um, not phosphorus, but um, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, right, across there to be able to pick those up and hold those in the soil, okay? So that being said, with what you have here, very, very typical Midwestern soil, you know, and in this case, uh, I don't see too much that I'm worried about here. Um, the base saturations, you know, it, basically, so, yeah, long time ago, maybe about 70 or so years ago, there's a gentleman out at the University of Missouri that said that, hey, if you have this specific ratio, right, of calcium to magnesium to potassium, that you're going to have the perfect soil to grow in. And so what, rather than look at the um, level of nutrients in the soil, they looked at these relationships, right, as a ratio between those three um, cations, right? And so people started saying, hey, if you get to 68% calcium, so on and so forth, that you'll have the perfect soil and anything that grows in there will be awesome. And so years and years and years of research have borne out that it's really not true, right? That they're in certain, in very, very, very specific uh, situations, it does make sense. But those are such a sliver, like a tiny, 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 tiny sliver. And especially in turf, there's, there's very little, if any, difference, right? So we're more concerned with the levels that are in the soil. So, Ray, if you want to go through here, like just going across of you know, what's high, what's low, and some of the relationships, right, between um, <coughs> particularly the cations, but also, you know, talking about P as an anion and what it does and some of the roles that it plays. All right, okay. Can I give a, a brief, brief, brief thing here? Yeah. Sure. The, uh, the, sure. First, the first number is my front yard, and the second mm -hmm. number is my backyard under the trees, because I, did, I didn't know if right. it was like a, the pH and all that stuff was different, so just for all intents and purposes, let's just maintain the first line, not the second line. Okay. So okay. those were like the second part of my yard. So go ahead. Okay. So what you're seeing here basically is you are seeing soil that to me is, of course, ideal because you have adequate uh, potassium, you have adequate phosphorus and your ph is actually neither high nor low because by the way matt would you like to trade soil with me <laughs> no yeah would you like would you like to trade soil with I'll me trade, because... hey, I'll, I'll trade environment with you but i won't trade soil okay but anyway what <laughs> it is is that you you have a, a ph of 6.6 .6. So what that means is that even your minerals like your zinc, your manganese, and your iron, and your copper, that is, at that range, your grass is able to naturally uptake it from the soil. And so you're one of those people that actually do not need to push iron, push chelated micronutrients, and do all of that stuff because... Your grass is actually as green as it's going to get. Okay. Okay? That's the bottom line on this. Your grass is as green as it's going to get. And, okay, you had a question about cation exchange capacity. And what that relates to is, again, ability of the soil to take whatever nutrients are in it and hang on to them and then meter them back out to the grass you know as the grass needs it now that can actually go both ways because if your cation exchange capacity is say under 10 a low number then what that means is that your soil has very little ability to hang on to your nutrients conversely if you are over 20 what can happen is think of that bratty kid that takes all the balls 
and he doesn't let anybody else play. It's like he takes it all, he keeps it to himself, and everybody else can go whistle Dixie. That can happen in a soil too, where if your cation exchange capacity is too high, whatever nutrients are in the soil are there, but they're locked up. And oh, by the way, Matt, a way to get excessively high cation exchange capacity is to put or apply too much organic matter, too much humic, too much carbon, too much biochar, because all of those materials are very absorbent. Because I know the latest craze is to apply materials to the turf that contain biochar. And I look at that very cautiously. Not, you have not, have not added any biochar this year yet because I'm saving that for the, the like the, the late part of the year because like I was telling the pre-show that I, I've got one bag of Carbon X and that's all I've really used for biochar. Um, but, I started and, and okay. buying this stuff two years ago with Matt. Okay, well, and in happy. the case and and in the case of the Carbon X. There's nothing wrong with that because the biochar is nothing more than a matrix that is used to hold on to the nitrogen and the other nutrients to release it back to the grass. I'm talking about these other products that are mostly biochar and don't have many nu any nutrients in them and supposedly they make claims about those products that, oh, this will, in quote, unquote, improve your soil. And I'm sure you've seen some of those on YouTube where this, you know, carbon-based product will, quote, unquote, improve your soil. Uh, my words to that are, don't you believe it? Because... Uh, I do believe that with, you know, additives, products, etc., there's a such thing as too much of a good thing. Because with your soil, I could not imagine myself applying very much of anything to this soil other than whatever nitrogen the grass happens to need to maintain growth. So you're kind that, of right on the money. Yeah, that, that was the money with the plant aluminum I, I, sulfate. That, yeah, uh, when I when I told Matt I was going to apply that, and he goes, "Well, wh why don't you apply some stuff with some potassium in it?" And I'm like, "Well, I said my potassium levels are 200 per acre." And he goes, "Okay, mm -hmm. I can see why you don't add it." Um, but like I said, I was adding a quarter of a pound of nitrogen via either ammonium sulfate. Liquid uh, 1801 or Carbon X uh, for the first six weeks. Every week I apply it a quarter, uh, quarter of a, or a, yeah, quarter of a pound. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to didn't want to stress it too much. I figured you know you know spoon feed first uh, six weeks, and then um, I think I put my first half a pound on there mid October, and then I put another half a pound on maybe November 1st, more or less just for the, um, the winter. Um, it wasn't, didn't, didn't get really brown until about mid January. And then, uh, about April, we got a, about a week of degrees and it kind of greened up a little bit. Then we got cold. And then after that, it's been same color really ever since. I, I, I could said, I, I, I could not have drawn this up any better the way the, the, the yard really grew, uh, filled in, still looks a year later almost. Um, I, 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 look, I, I, walk, I, I walk my dog three or four times a day and I, and I always come up to my yard, my neighbor's yard, and it's night and day. It's like, uh, you know, uh, yin yang. It's like completely different. So, and the fact that that picture right there just shows you that you know it's a it's a solid consistent yard i wish i would have sent him a picture he did a drone footage over my house and he kind of just 
flew right over the the front part of my house on the roof and just did a kind of a, a pan video and mm -hmm. just i i mean I, I i really shouldn't you know just stop talking about my yard but i just i'm so proud of it um just the fact that you have some, i took something, you some that, most people would have, I, I took something that most people would have i took something that most people uh would have been proud of and completely burned it off went to bare soil planted grass in the middle of august you know um yeah that was the day I that was that was the day I seeded right there, and just you know five days later I had a little grass seedlings. I went out I went to church one uh, a Sunday morning and I looked outside and I'm like going oh my gosh I got grass seedlings so I had to go get my phone, take a picture of it you know. Um, and if anybody wants to follow my progress of my uh, there's my oh yeah eleven year old yeah, daughter mowing the grass. Uh, um, it's on the lawn forum. It's on the Cool Season Lawn Journal. Um, I don't know of any way I can really put this on there, but if you go to the lawn, uh, lawn forums, cool season journal, and I'll just look up Matt's front yard, Reno, uh, it's on there. Um, but I no, took pictures you... from. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You took pictures from how long? No, you're going to say something. I was. I was going uh, to plug the lawn forum, but go ahead, go ahead. Let me plug the lawn forum. <laughs> John Ware can John Ware can wait for a second, but I just want to plug the lawn for him here. But go ahead, you go first. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I went on there and actually the the tipping point of my deciding of uh to nuke the yard was uh, right where that little section is. Okay, there's there's a section of my house. I this is called board on my on my daughter's iPad. Um so there's my section, and if you look at sections one and four, that's probably my main grass that I have, you know, really good grass. Uh, the section three is the area that really got hit with the heat, and that's where I did the more of the lawn uh, leveling. Uh, section two was the uh, creeping Charlie <laughs> slash tiller uh, event, and then the little section number on the top right is my compost area where i just take all the grass clippings sometimes like in the late fall and or the leaves and i just take it over there and i take my tiller and i just till up the leaves and uh because there's no grass that goes back there and there's three trees that uh are in that area so i, I don't want to really maintain it so i just call that my little bermuda, bermuda triangle so um if you look on the section where it says patio plants that area did actually have some poa trivias and poa annua last year and i i was able to just pull out bunches of grass and that was probably in june um it was a completely different color green i said no i'm doing this that was i think i had just gotten that pilot in the mail that day before and i was ready to spray that uh zoysia or buffalo grass or whatever it was and um so then i was actually talking to the grass daddy and uh I said, is this poa? And he goes, yep. Because it has like a little rippled edge on the on the leaf blade, if I'm not correct, right, uh, Ryan? Yeah, that's... Uh, it has like a little rippled way, edge. Yeah, It has like a little yes. rippled on the on the leaf blade, yeah. Because he had a picture on his, on his, uh, on, on the long form site. And uh, I said, yep, that's what this is. And he goes... And I looked at I looked at all the area that you can see where it was, and it was pretty about a ten foot by ten foot section in that front yard. So I uh, went to my local Big R store, got a bottle of uh, glyphosate, and I, <laughs> I sent out the hail mary. Hey, I, I sprayed that I sprayed do. that first that, that first that first stripe of uh, glyphosate, and then I I got to the end of the yard, and I'm like going, oh, well, can't can't stop now. Let's go. So I'll tell you what, I, I, I'll tell you this, Matt, I do projects that are, you know, seven figures sometimes, and there is nothing, nothing in the world like crossing the point of no return, man. It's like the, <laughs> the, the craps dice are over the table, flying through the air, about to hit that back wall, and you don't know if you're going to get seven, eleven, or craps, and God, I love it. I love that. I love, I love the action. I do, real quick, though, that was a, it was a... It was a great drawing. I don't think that you're ever going to uh, pass the uh, registered landscape architect exam with your drawing, 
but I do know for a fact that you can grow grass better than just about any landscape architect that I know. So kudos to you. Uh, yeah, and I do so want to give a job at Disney's. So a, a job at Disney is not a good thing for an, an, anime animation at Disney is not a good 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 job for me. No, I don't know. I mean, if there if there's somebody out there doing anime grass, though, I kind of want to see that. It sounds kinky. I think I might be into that. <laughs> um, so the lawn form. Let's talk real quick about that. It's a it's a fantastic site, right? And it is such a great mm-hmm. weekend to advertise this because it is Independence Day, right? And so if you don't know the backstory, I always like to say this, and this is totally kind of self-serving, so just give me a minute here to get on my soapbox. So uh, the Lawn Forum was founded by a gentleman named John Ware, and John is a great human being, he's a great American, and he does a service uh, for all of us that, you know, uh, it doesn't cure cancer or do any anything life-saving, but it gives everybody an outlet to learn and grow and try to get better and share what they know so that other people can do the same thing and where this all came from um there was an an older forum that used to be out there it's i think it still exists and um i used to get into some pretty heated discussions with the the big guy over there the 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 head moderator or whatever you want to call it and john would kind of chip in there and and kind of come to my defense always and Finally, at one point, he got kicked out, and the guy said, if you think you can do this, well, why don't you go run your own forum? Well, it turns out that John did that, right? He didn't just kick the tires on the lawn forum. He actually built the thing from the ground up, and now that forum does, like, I don't even know. It's like 12x more traffic and posts. It's, it's substantial. So if you haven't been on the lawn forum, you don't know what it is, please, I implore you to go to thelawnforum.com check it out there's a ton of good information on there that you can start searching from learning from diving into and connecting with the community that will ultimately you know maybe get you on the show someday or whatever the case might be but it's a fantastic place to go to get some really good um anecdotal advice and some really good scientific advice as well to base your lawn program around so john if you're listening i'd like to think that i own like 0.0001% because I was able to get somebody pissed off enough to make you pissed off enough to go out and make your own independence day on the lawnform.com. So thank you very much, sir. Now I do digress. Um, All right. So (laughs) just to see what to go grab a a refill. (laughs) That's fine. That's fine. (laughs) That that is awesome. (laughs) So um just you know we're, we're kind of coming down to the end of it here but what questions do you have for us there's no rush but what questions do you have for us in terms of you know what's next or um do you just want to come on here and rap because i i can tell you're proud right and you should be like that please don't ever put up those defense mechanisms of oh i'm talking too much about it like what you did um you had a plan right and you clearly you researched it clearly you put a lot of thought into it you executed said plan and now you're reaping the results. And, uh, you know, for that, I think you should be very, very proud. There's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing well, to be, you. um, you know, nothing to be like, Hey, I'm such a nerd that my grass looks good. Like if, if this is what you like to oh, do, trust me, I, I get, I get crap from my friends. They're like, well, that grass sounds great. That grass is great. That's okay. Um, I've been doing that. My own. Uh, Matt, I've been, Matt, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been married for 17 of those, and I get crap from my wife every day for talking about grass. So don't feel bad. <laughs> well, that was that was the other thing is because I was talking to a friend of mine, and um, it's just me that lives here with my kids. But um, uh, that was one thing I could do this, and I don't have to answer anybody. That was that was that was you know that was the other thing is like I can just mm-hmm. do whatever I want. If I mess mm-hmm. up and my yard looks like crap, then it's my fault. If my if I did that ten years ago, and I look like crap, and then well then you know then I got to hear from her. So you know, but that, on a side no, note, that that's that. that's one of the other things. Yeah, the politics of your situation were a little bit more clear cut. I get <sighs> that, and I think some guys worry about that and stress about it. And you know that the thing the the reality of it is, and Ray, you know this right, is that the shit will grow back right like we'll figure out a way it's not like you know the the only thing we're giving up necessarily is a little bit of money and time right so and and you can plan ahead for that so i've talked i got plenty of time what other questions do you have 
What other questions do you have? Uh, my 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 only question is um, okay. So I've been uh, I applied my first insecticide. Um, I used the uh, I don't know. It's the Dominion Two L. Is it uh, mm -hmm. um, okay? Okay. I'm not yeah. not too familiar with that. So I applied that. Um, now I haven't really seen too much grub. Uh, interaction. I applied Disease X last year, and like around May or June or something like that. I did this about three weeks ago, so first part of June. Mm -hmm. Do I need to uh, 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 insect, insecticide, and fungicide? I I did a thing of prop on the same day. I did prop the, the was it the mock Yeah, I did those two on the same day. Um, do I need to do anything further unless I see something, or is it just more of a preventative for the? For that, for those two items, because I've never applied any kind of uh, insecticide or fungicide before. Well, I, I guess I did the, the, the Scott's Disease X last year, but it was just the one and done, so I didn't know. Like I said, I haven't really seen any yeah. disease. I haven't really seen any signs of grubs in my yard. I mean, you're always going to have grubs in the yard, but um, oh yeah, that's that, that's that, a, that was one uh, question. I love I love that that mindset too because I think okay. For, for those watching and those that will watch, please understand everybody will have grubs in their yard, right? So the idea and principle of providing, of excuse me, of applying a preventative grub uh, control application is to reduce populations such that they will not manifest as damage in your lawn, right? So we know that if we count, right, upwards of eight to upwards of 10, grubs per square foot we're going to see damage at the surface right so the idea is is that okay hey if we can reduce that population by just say 50 percent right yes there'll be grubs feeding on our lawn but we'll never know it we'll, we won't see the damage because the grass will be able to grow through it okay and so people get freaked out where they see one grub when they dig a hole or you know search around <laughs> for an irrigation head or something like that and they go out there like Charlie is in the jungle and we're about to blow the Viet Cong up, man. Like they are <laughs> napalming the ever living hell out of the lawns. And it's like, you know, March. you probably don't need to do that. You probably don't need to do that. So, you know, I think the bottom line here is if you've made an application of Dominion 2L, which is going to be a, a liquid version of um, a metacloprid, you know, I'll let Ray kind of explain some of the, the theory and thought behind the neonicotinoids versus some of the newer chemistry and some of the things that are pluses and minuses and things like that. I'll just say from a management standpoint that the timing of what you did for the Midwest is fine. Okay. Uh, I think you'll set yourself up very well because you're only worried really about the grubs that are going to start coming to the surface and feeding here in the next probably eight to. 12 weeks or so right um maybe in a little bit shorter than that actually like six to eight weeks so that is if, if you made that application just you know here recently totally fine you're gonna be fine there on the fungicide side that is where you really have to understand your weather and how it responds and so if i were you and you seem kind of like the the person that is willing to practice restraint um so long as you have control right so meaning that okay i'm willing to hold off and doing something and applying a whole bunch of stuff preventatively if i know what i'm looking for and i can react quickly enough to take care of it and so if i were you what i would be looking for specifically especially on tall fescue and young still relatively immature tall fescue is brown patch in your location and the things that i'd be looking for in terms of brown patch is wet weather like you just had right and daytime highs upper 80s and nighttime lows above you know 67 68 which is probably going to be most of your weeks so i i think if you get in the habit of doing a good scouting run on the lawn you said you walk the dog four or five times a day you know if you have the opportunity go out and walk that lawn and you'll see uh any indication of that right so some good stuff i'll see if i can find a good uh, link while ray's talking about um you know, some of the indicative signs or the telltale signs of brown patch and high cut turf. And it's real easy to spot once you know what you're looking now, is there, for. Is there a difference between the height of cut that affects this? 
Does the height of cut affect not, the chances of it really? No, not, not in, really on tall fescue. Not in not tall really fescue. fescue. Because I've been, uh, I've been cutting it about two and three quarters to three inches. I know that's short relatively for tall fescue because Pete's always talking about mowing it at four and a quarter and four and a half. Uh, oh, I would lose my daughter's don't, baseballs yeah, and softballs yeah, in that yard. No, don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I have nothing against Pete. Great dude. Never met him, but uh, you don't need to be cutting tall fescue that high. Now, two and three quarters, fairly short for tall fescue. It'll it'll live. It'll be fine. I mean, there's tall fescue that's managed and maintained here in the Midwest from, you know, west of Chicago, <laughs> Pittsburgh, well below that, you know, sub two inches. Um, and even down to an inch and it's fine, but it's also on a preventative fungicide program and it's managed very, very, um, at a very, very high level. And so I think for you in your case is learning what those telltale signs are and learning how to scout disease, that particular disease of brown patch is going to be your friend. You know, if you keep up on the end, you know, dollar spot and some of these other things, you really probably, probably won't have to worry about. You know, you've got. Um, well, that, that's another soil, question think, later, but. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. If, and if you're keeping up with like what you said, a quarter pound on uh, your foliar products, you know, your, your liquid product products, I don't see any major issue. Ray, I know you had something to say, so go ahead and say that. And if you can, can you touch on for um, Matt here about the neonicotinoids? So your imidacloprids, your arenas, meridians, all that kind of stuff versus um you know what's now in grub x and also sold commercially for us as a celeprin okay the dominion which is the imidacloprid liquid is basically the what i call the second generation insecticides that came around after the 1990s and when Ryan says new nicotinoids, the reason why they're called that is because they're basically synthesized versions of the poison nicotine. So what the chemists at Bayer, Syngenta, and uh, you know Dow and whatever have done is they've taken nicotine and remade the molecule such that it is not toxic to us, minimally toxic to birds, fish, you know, and in some cases, most other insects, except for bees, they haven't, you know, solved that problem yet. But it is basically something where if the grub tries to eat grass that is treated with this, it gets the equivalent of nicotine poisoning. And the good part about this is, is... Yes, this is like... Uh, is that filtered? Is that filtered? No, you know what this is? This is like the whole pack of Marlboros unfiltered. Whole pack, like right trying, now. Yep. Camel. Yep, <laughs> Camel. Like... Yeah, trying yeah. to trying to put that uh, wet piece of toilet paper in the airplane lavatory over top of the smoke detector, sucking down a Winston after that business class dinner. That's what this is. Yeah, but then that's what it does to the grubs. But like I said, the, the big issue with that is that these chemicals are not selective to bees. So if bees, for example, are directly contacted by this, if bees visit plants that are treated with this, there's a potential for the bees to be harmed. But what has come onto the market, I'd want to say in the last uh, five years, is something called an anthranilic diamide. I mean, that's the, the official you know, chemical class of it. But just know that what this does, which is what is in the new version of GrubX, you know, the Scots GrubX, and what Ryan was talking about, which is available to us professional 
turf managers is called acelaprin. Okay, the active ingredient in that is very specific to caterpillars and caterpillar-like insects in that the caterpillar eats this product and its exoskeleton starts to disintegrate. And that disintegration happens like, uh, I want to say, within 24 hours. Now, there are some key differences in that something like GrubX is very selective. It only affects grubs. It's not particularly toxic to bees. And other feature that I think is a plus too is that what the experience has been with the GrubX is that it can actually last longer than your imidacloprid or Dominion application. So that's like the main, you know, differences from the, you know, a grub prevention point. Which is a, is a great point, right, Ray? So because it lasts longer, it's less soluble in water, which is also why the timing's different. So, you know, I think it was, somebody can maybe jump in here and help me, but three, maybe four years ago that they switched over from imidacloprid in the commercially available big box version of GrubX, right? right. Over to um, the acelaprin active ingredient, right? Mm -hmm. And what people were kind of had locked in their minds was, oh, hey, I need to apply this sometime between like Memorial Day and the 4th of July, something like that. You can still do that and have really good success with the acelaprin, but you can really and ideally apply it earlier than that, right? So you really want to apply this like you know, Easter time. So sometime in April, actually here in the Midwest, because it's uh, that much more insoluble. It takes longer for it to solubilize in the soil, get into the plant and ultimately be effective against um, when those grubs begin to feed. And it also has some pretty decent, decent activity against surface feeders from a, uh, a preventative standpoint for a while. So you know, depending on what kind of grass yeah. you're in, Go ahead. Yes, yeah, yes, that is, that is absolutely correct. And the the whole point about this, you know, what you say, reduced, you know, solubility and increased, you know, residual is that in actual practice, Easter or tax day is actually ideal because it will take that much longer for it to become incorporated in the grass. And you don't lose anything by being early with this because it just stays for so long in the grass. So it's not like you're in the cloprid where if you're too early, it can be gone before you actually need it. That's like the, the danger right. of something like, like imidacloprid or arena or uh, meridian is that those those products can actually be gone too soon but uh and also you said something about how the active ingredient is also effective on surface feeders uh, i was specifically told by the people at syngenta the people that make a celeprin that if you make an appropriate application of this in the spring you probably won't see my arch nemesis in turf grass that i affectionately call the cane corso <laughs> and that is based on a catastrophic situation that was uh posted on the lawn forum that was later taken down. Somebody, you know, journaled their Bermuda sod install that turned disastrous. And the bottom line of that is that he didn't prepare to deal with sod webworm and fall armyworm in that Bermuda sod. Uh. 
Okay, because yeah, that could be a t- that could be a tough year. Could be a tough winter if you didn't do that. Yikes. Yeah. So in so anyway, had he thought ahead, planned ahead, and had been ready, his response would have been to get that Scott's Grubex down over his recently installed, you know, Bermuda sod, no questions asked, just get it done and do it. You know, rather than, you know, do, do what ha- what transpired after that uh, situation. So, because by the way, that is probably my one strike against imidacloprid and the neonicotinoids is that most of them don't have very high activity against sod webworm and armyworm. They help a little, but not as much as I'd like them to. Yeah, and a couple other things I want to say on this point, because we're, and we're a little bit late in the season. I'll say this on late season. This is late season at this point. Applications of acelaprin. So Oklahoma State did this work eh, like seven or eight years ago, something like that, doing very late. And again, Oklahoma is a little bit different climate than you know, Springfield, Illinois, or Central Ohio, the Midwest, right? But um, doing applications, I think, as late as July 1 and maybe even July 15 and for control of grubs, and they were 90-plus percent, right? So they were they were doing a really good job, even late on the acelerant. So don't get freaked out, like, if you're listening to this, watching it, whatever, and be like, oh, crap, I didn't get my grub X out or something like that. Make the application, right? You're not wasting it at this point. But the other thing there, too, is that it needs water, right? So if you're in a a, a drought situation, that's one where you're going to want to get it, you know, watered in as best as possible, whether that's through natural rainfall and trying to time it up ahead of rain or through irrigating it in. And that's a really, really important and crucial step into having protection, right, against once this stuff starts to happen. The other thing I want to make mention of, too, is that there are different formulations of these products, right, specifically for a celebrant. So, you know, this is something I looked up a while ago because there was a video from a uh, specific lawn YouTuber that was pushing um, a celebrant G, which is Syngenta's granular formulation of a celebrant. Now, I'm not here to talk shit on a celebrant G. Fine product, work great, no problem, Right. But when you look at, you know, the cost breakdown and equal rates, like looking at it, apples to apples, right? So you've got that that comes in at about $6 a thousand square feet, okay? Not bad. Doesn't seem too bad. Now you take it down and you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or any of your other big box stores and you pick yourself up a bag of Grubex, which now has that same active ingredient that a seller print on the commercial side has. You apply that at the label rate you're about four dollars and 15 cents per thousand square feet okay now if you're able to go to um you know a site one and ewing one of the the larger uh turf distributors here whether it's regional in your area or nationwide you should should uh, be able to find um a product that has a celebrant in it that's on a, a fertilizer carrier quite often this is you know, a 007, uh, you know, a potassium chloride um, based carrier, and you're putting this down somewhere between like three and three and a half pounds per thousand. And your cost per thousand on that is somewhere around $2.50, maybe a little bit higher, but 250 to 275. So if you're really budget conscious, right, and you're talking about saving, well, hey, who cares about two bucks per thousand? Well, it's 50%, right, versus uh, the 415 with GrubX. If you want to make it easy on yourself, go pick up the GrubX, throw that down. If you want to save a little bit more money, or if you have a big lawn or something like that at scale and you're trying to save some money, look at the um, fertilizer that's been impregnated with the acelaprin. So just some things to consider. Matt, on 2,000 square foot, I'd be sending the GrubX all day long. I mean, I get the whole point of spraying the the uh, metacloprid. I guess what gave you that idea or... You're not wrong for doing it. Please don't, please understand. I'm not calling you and saying that you're wrong, but what was the impetus to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and purchase that Dominion and use that product. Um, well, uh, 
I watched a couple of YouTubes and, and Alan with the lawn care nut was one of them that said that. And uh, I, I mean, I'm, I used Grubex last year. I was more of a cost efficient, you know, they said a bottle should last you, you know, about four or five years. Um, sure. That was really my main thing. Um, not like I spent uh, uh, the Pilex price on it. Um, it was, <laughs> no. it was probably $40 for the bottle that lasts me five years. I mean, I sprayed yeah, all over the whole yard. I mean, I didn't just. Oh yeah. 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 But, you, yeah. You, you were able to get everything. Cause you know, generally speaking, I want to say on that particular product, it should be like half ounce per thousand, 22 ounces per acre or something like that. Something like that. But, um, so that does make it pretty my yards, effective. My yard's about, my yard's about 7,500 square feet. So, okay. you know, that's so, six applications. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, and, and really yeah. that's not bad at all. So Ray, if you could, why don't you touch on real quick, if you were going to make a liquid application of that product in particular, or even the Acelopren product, if you were really feeling spendy and you want to go up to like yeah, 125 you want it to be crazy. an acre. Yeah. Yeah. But you get awesome coverage, all that kind of stuff. What would be some of the best practices for you from a one, you know, a nozzle choice, carrier volume, and any adjuvants that you would put into the tank to ensure that it made it to the target? Okay, first of all would be <coughs> my prep prior to even trying to make that, you know, grub and, you know, insect control application. And what that would involve is pretreatment of the turf with a wetting agent and watering that all in a day or two before I planned on applying my, say, my acelaprin or my imidacloprid suspension. And then when I'm actually applying, what I am looking for is I'm looking for a spray tip that makes coarse drops, drop spaced relatively close together. And I don't want any drift off target away from the lawn, especially if the product is some kind of neonicotinoid because I, let me tell you folks something, and to all the listeners that are probably wondering because neonicotinoids are in the news and in advertisements and in hit pieces, whatever, but the largest source of bee exposure to neonicotinoids involves either spray drift or direct application two plants that are in bloom that are then immediately visited by bees. So if I'm spraying imidacloprid on a lawn, which I do quite often, it's done with something like, say, an air-inducted T-jet nozzle set to apply coarse droplets close together. I'm operating that nozzle no more than 20 inches from the turf. And on a day that is not windy, I'm spraying. And this is very important. Once I'm done spraying, I am watering that application in as soon as I put the sprayer down. I don't mm -hmm. leave it till tomorrow. I don't leave it till it rains. Because by the way, folks, some of you listening in are aware of this proposed labeling change for imidacloprid that states that spray applications to residential lawns will no longer be allowed. And the reason for that is because the EPA has determined that both, you know, cats and domestic cats and dogs, as well as, you know, children are getting excessive exposure to that active ingredient because too many lawns in America are sprayed with imidacloprid and that spray application is not being watered in. Yeah, um, there's just no a part side note, when I did spray that in, Go. yeah, um, I did water, like I said, I watered each section in about 20 to 30 minutes uh, just for that fact. Oh, the only thing that I didn't do that Ray said was I didn't water, I didn't have a, a wet, uh, moist soil 
going into it, I probably had the, the hardest the soil has been. But I did use that air induction uh, nozzle T jet, and mm -hmm. um, I did. I mean, I probably watered it within like half an hour of spraying everything. I went up to the, my water village or city village and got that uh, uh, sewer bypass or the that bypass meter for my lawn or my spigot outside. And I, like I said, I, I watered every every section of my yard for about 20, 30 minutes. So I did do that. Um, there wasn't, okay. any, and I and I I've heard a lot of stuff about the minochloropid with the the bees and stuff like that. So that that was on my mind too. Um, and they said mm -hmm. don't spray it like real, uh, like around your uh, flowering bushes and stuff like that. So, and there it wasn't really a, a windy day. So, mm -hmm. I felt safe okay. doing it. I felt like I. I, I did what I needed to do by watering it in. Um, so. Yeah. No, you, you know, you, Matt, I think you did everything right. Did right. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing that I was wanted to talk about was uh, going into uh, fall and uh, maybe what, uh, what, now I do do, I do a split application of for uh Usually, you know, a couple of weeks before, I would say about 50 degrees. Then I do want about when it, the soil temperatures get about 65, uh, mm -hmm. constant 65. I'm not talking it pops up to 65 and then it goes down to you know 60. Uh, right. I do that. So I, I haven't seen crabgrass in my yard in two years. I haven't, I haven't seen crabgrass in my yard in probably two three years. Um, unless I, the 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 reno, but you know, um, but going into the fall. I know I don't want to really push nitrogen and, until it gets to the mid 70s, you know, constant. And then, then uh, maybe this year we'll get the September rains because we didn't get September rains last year. Um, that helps a lot too. I, I was kind of I was kind of wishing on that because the, at that point the grass had already been germinated and mowed five or six times, and then still didn't get the rain. So I think we had like an inch of rain in, in six weeks when I when I did the the reno. It's usually how it goes. Um, but <laughs> I'd rather have that than eight inches of rain in, in 10 days. Oh. So I was, I, nice I was that was my yeah. only fear going into it. I'd rather, like I said, I'd rather pay the $100, which I did, to, you know, for the, for the watering. But um, just going into <laughs> fertilization, um, you know, pushing the growth of the potassium with the roots and stuff like that. And uh, what more or less nutrients uh going into the, the the really the second full year of my yard and what to maybe expect next year other than watching out for maybe like the possible uh reemergence of my zoysia hopefully i don't see that but that's really my only um pretty much i mean i've watched i've spent time on youtube and i spent time listening to matt i've spent time uh you know, out in the yard and, and seeing what the yard, how it reacts with what I've done with it. Um, but just uh, that first year after the Reno, if there's anything that I need to either look for, uh, uh, avoid, you know, nutrients wise, you know, hit it with some, you know, maybe a half a pound of nitrogen every, you know, three, four weeks or hit it with a pound of nitrogen every month. So, um, and then maybe uh, apply you know, uh, some stuff with some phosphorus after the summer's over. Uh, uh, I've talked enough. So, uh, what would, no, what no, would no, be no, going no. You're, into you're, the you're, fall? Yeah, yeah. I, we're big. We're big fans of going hearing into you the think fall and coming that. into the going into the fall. So here's versus then yeah. So here's what I would say first to start off is in cool season country, right? Your growing season starts September 1. Now, that sounds really counterintuitive, right? Like, what the hell is this guy I smoking, understand that. right? September 1. Well, again, let's think about... Let me see if I can send this to Jay Pink, and I'll, we'll do a little bit of a... Multitasking. While, while I'm thinking about this, what... what, what uh, <clears throat> just if, if you... Now, now remind you, I have, the, I have the Carbon X, so that's probably my main stuff. That I'll be using. I still got some ammonium sulfate, and I've got, yeah, okay, I got one one unsealed, one unopened bag. It's still sealed. It's sitting in the box that I got shipped to, 
because I was told not to use it going into the winter months because it's a slow release. That was per Matt. I got you. He said, use it in April. So He's I never use it in April. Individual. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I, like I said, I've, 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 I bounced many ideas off him. So, uh, and then that was the last email I sent to him. I was like, Hey, you know, what does it take to get on the show? Because I'd really like the, you know, he, cause he's, he's seen my <laughs> progress and he's, he's really liked it. So, uh, I figured, you know, why not? Hey, the only, the only stupid questions you don't, or that you ask are the ones you don't ask. So, you know, he's only going to say, no. I always like to say, uh, I always like the saying of there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. And those are the people that don't ask questions. So you, you sir are, are definitely not one of those people. Let me send this to a pink who has been awesome, by the way, if, if you're watching and wondering how any of us look good during this show, it's because of my man. Don't make me mute. I'm going to mute your mic. Don't, you, don't. You, you can do it. You, you can do it. And I'll just, I'll take my shirt off if you do that. And you'll have no choice but to show. Well, me. I got a haircut today, so I'm looking all fresh. You're, you do. You look good. <clears throat> and Ray's looking great. All right, Ray's looking great. He hasn't moved. He hasn't moved a bit. I haven't moved all right. a bit. <laughs> He's back there. He's probably been doing an OnlyFans cam show for the entire two hours of this. He's made ninety-seven dollars in tips, and yeah, he's probably gonna go mow some milfs lawn somewhere on the other side of wahoo when this is all over because it's only like four o'clock in the afternoon there so god bless you ray i love you i wish i could live your life all right so <laughs> or not let's look well hey hey so let's look at this real quick so here is why i say september one let's look at the growth curve right so we've got shoot growth or top growth here on the top and the green we've got root growth down here on the bottom and the white and the gray so when I say September 1 and why it's so important, imagine I'm drawing a line right there in between summer and fall and look at where that's at, right? So we're in not quite peak top growth, right? But we're producing a substantial amount of more. Our growth potential is much higher in that fall period, right? And to the extent possible that we're also maxing out on our roots right here. Now, if you look at this and think of this, this is, you know, just typical, it's not necessarily what actually happens but it's a typical type of growth curve of what you see between shoot and root growth. So we take this all the way through fall and we're living off of what roots we grow in the fall, right? They might shrink a little bit. They might die back a little bit in the winter time, depending on how harsh of a winter we have, how much snow cover we have, all that sort of stuff that we deal with in the Midwest. But then coming into spring, they surge back. So look at here. So if I have piss poor roots in the fall going into the winter, it doesn't matter how the spring shapes up. I might be screwed already, right? So it's indicative that, or it's, it's indicative of, of people that don't plan ahead in the fall that get screwed over in the spring and the summer the following year. So my message to you on the fertility side would be hold off right now. Do not juice that grass up. If you're going to continue to do your quarter pound apps through liquid or uh, foliar products, that's fine. No big deal. If you're going out like every four weeks with that for the rest of the summer. But come you know when we hit here this september 1st date i'd be pushing the throw chips down and probably try, throw down yeah, probably trying to yeah. probably trying to get like <laughs> at least two pounds maybe two and a half pounds of n out and that should be in one application 60 percent no god no holy shit no cool oh Sorry. please don't Thank please you for, don't <laughs> yeah yeah i'm talking about i'm, I'm talking about well, maybe um, i might have I might have to take a nitro pill after I just heard that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, half a pound every, you know, starting like at the end of August, half a pound every, you know, three weeks, let's just say. Okay. And if you get four apps of that down to every two to four weeks, that gets you through the end of the year, you're done. November 1 or right around there, you're done for the year. And part of the reason I say this too is that um, we know – from some fantastic research um, that was done at the University of Wisconsin by uh, somebody, I'll, I'll plug another Discord here, is the Pro Turf Talks. We had our friend uh, Aldo Beltran host a fantastic uh, Pro Turf Talks um, with Ray, actually, just the other day. 
and with Bill Kreuzer from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, or formerly of the University of Nebraska Lincoln, who did all that work when he was back at University of Wisconsin. What he found, this is interesting, and this is where you want to take notes here, Matt, is that so we know that fall is a great time to apply nitrogen to cool season turf, right? Particularly here in the Midwest, right? Because we have, uh, you know, really nice weather, really good fall weather, really good uh, cool season grass growing weather, right? During that period. But what we don't have as we go through that fall period is what we is the water going up into the plant and carrying nitrogen with it, right? That's a process that's known as mass flow, right? So if you can think the plant doesn't eat, right, it drinks, okay? So as the plant, as the day lengths get shorter, as the temperatures cool off, the plant doesn't need as much water, which means it's not going to take in as much nitrogen. So what we find here is if you look at this calendar, again, September 1, if we were to make an application September 1 and we were to make an application November 1, the application in November, there's actually 88% less less nitrogen that's getting into the plant at the same exact rate as when we had applied back in September. So imagine you putting a dollar on your lawn and watching 90 cents of it evaporate for no, and nothing happening, right? You wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't make that application if you knew any better. So this is why that September through October period is so critical. And it's also a good idea, too, to start backing down your rates a little bit. So you can go a little bit higher than the half pound to start. But as you go deeper and deeper into the fall, back down those rates a little bit because there's just simply not as much nitrogen getting into the plant. Kind of treat it like a day summer. are getting shorter. What we'll say that again? I said kind of treating it like a summer where you don't want to really fertilize going in the summer. You want a fertilizer going in the winter. Yeah, yeah. And, and, this, is, and this is true. And I think... What you'll see on the back side of this, right, is one, you'll see deeper, darker green, longer, holding color, you know, clear through January, kind of like what you saw before, but uh, even more so because you have mature grass. And you'll also see uh, the results coming into spring the following year where, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't have to put much end down, if any, probably before, I would say, mid-May. And, and I, what I always tell I really didn't put anything down. Yeah. I didn't put any, I didn't put any nitrogen down. Uh, I put a, I put a, I'll have to check my journal, but I don't think I put a uh, half a pound down before May 1st. And I'm talking like even, even mid May into uh, Memorial day that I don't think you'll have to put that much down either. Um, typically what you want to look I put, for I is put about a, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say really all you're looking for is down stops. about mid-may okay no that's perfect well, what you're looking for your trigger sign and this is where you know catching your clippings can help because you can notice the increase in clippings of when you're getting towards you know that spring flush is you know typically during that time it, the plant is trying to consume a lot of carbohydrates now there's things you can do and i we're too deep in the show now of there's things you can do to trick it and use some pgrs and things like that to help your cause in terms of naps at that time but just say, leave the PGRs out of it for just a second, okay? And when we get to that spring flush, right as that's starting to happen, that's when we want to make sure that we have nitrogen down. Not because we want it to grow into the flush and through the flush, but on the back side of that, right, it's going to be a little bit starved for nutrients, and it's going to want a little tiny bit of a, of a bump, right? So, again, that half to three-quarters of a pound, I have no problem with that. Really, then, at that point, if I was in your case and had – um you know, the gumption and the drive that you do, I would be liquid only, you know, small shots, quarter pound or less, you know, going through the summer on a monthly basis. And then fall time again is your time to gear up. And that's where you're going to try and get two, two and a half pounds of N out. And that would really be my nitrogen application strategy for the year is, you know, a very small amount in the spring, say half to three quarters of a pound foliar or liquid through the summertime and then step on the gas in the fall. Uh, what about any like phosphorus or potassium or anything like that going that you need to look out for? Uh, with your situation, I wouldn't, uh, you know, Ray, a little one, one, one on the fall ain't going to hurt, right? No, it, it wouldn't hurt. But then let me ask you this, Matt. Do you regularly collect clippings? I, I collect no clippings until I would say late October when I have a lot of tree leaves. Um, 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but mainly now for the, I would say 90% of the time I don't, I don't, I, I mulch. Okay. Okay. That, that's good because the only time I start to push high phosphorus and high potassium, you know, in a fertilizer along with nitrogen is if I know somebody is consistently and constantly collecting clippings throughout their growing season because when you remove clippings, that is where you can remove a lot of phosphorus and potassium from the soil every time you collect the clippings and bag them up. So because you're mulching, I would not be alarmed if you just maintained your nitrogen amounts and you applied nitrogen according to how Ryan li lined out because, again, that buildup of the plant's reserves over the late summer and fall is probably the most important thing you can do for the grass because what that means is that if you build up your your nitrogen reserves and your and the strength of your grass in that fall period, when springtime comes around, your lawn is going to be the lawn that is just uh, glowing in the dark come spring, and you haven't had to do anything or much of anything to it fertilizer-wise in the spring. You're on cruise control almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you just, uh, as you tail off uh, from the reserve that you built up in the spring into, into early summer, that's when you can, you know, give it a little bit of uh, a bump, you know, but there's no urgency to massively feed it in the spring, provided you give the grass enough, you know, sustenance over the fall. Completely in the green. So, um, so then during the spring, you know, just kind of hit it lightly, and then maybe a, a time before Memorial Day, you know, late May, and then basically. Uh, you know, just kind of spoon feed it liquid. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, that 700 really doesn't add much. It's more for, uh, more for, I, I would think, not even really top row. Um, but I mean, it gives, it gives a little something, but mainly I bought that 700 mainly for the iron. And I do that maybe once a month and it's not, I, I don't, I do, I don't do a heavy app. Um, yeah, and that that's but, one where yeah. you know to, if it's a if it's a cost thing or a performance thing. I mean, I think you can get, I, I you know, nothing. It's that product. It 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 is what it is. It serves a purpose. It comes pre made, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you can get standalone nitrogen sources, right? And then if you're concerned with iron, there's also some other products out there that if you want to mix that in. I I think from a a cost perspective you could do better right it's not a bad product i'm not here to shit talk it or anything like that but um there there's other no, things i've, I've tried that iron out there no oh, i tried the iron i put that on my on my dad's yard and that was that actually did pretty good but no um i I've, I've looked at other things but you know i just we can I talk, that, we can that talk more about that yeah all right no, that's the that's the, no, that's I, the I just, next product, right? Green County. Yeah. Okay. What, what okay. stuff is that? No, the set. No, no, that's the micro. That's the what is that? The, oh, that's the less country, country. I don't know. Yeah, site one, uh, the seven oh oh. Actually, I think it's twelve oh oh. So I put down yeah twelve oh oh with uh, with iron and so, uh, yeah I'll pull the label up here yeah that that's a fine product like. Iron and nitrogen, iron and nitrogen. Yeah, that's uh, nothing wrong with it. But uh, let me ask you this. How much greening do you get out of that application of that 1200, Matt? How much? Uh, probably not as much as I thought. Okay. You know what that tells me? That tells my, me that my soil you can't take any more iron. You don't need it. Save your money. 
save your money, save your effort, because uh, one of the, I think, axioms of uh, you know, turf management and maintenance is, like, for example, with what I do, I'm always trying to get the most performance out of a turf area with minimal work and minimal materials. Because every additional application I have to make, every additional procedure I have to do is money out of my pocket. So um, just as I, just as I was looking at that soil test, I noticed that that uh, soil test went from six point nine soil pH to six point one, and mm -hmm. probably three fourths of my fertilizer that I put on there was ammonium sulfate. So uh, apparently that does bring down the, the, the soil pH. And, and I don't know what the, the new grass germination stuff like that does to soil pH. I don't know if it draws out a lot of nutrients and affects the soil pH, but that was one of the things. And the other things that I asked uh, Matt was, uh, I noticed that my iron was really low compared to the other one. I think the other one was, was maybe 170 versus this one was 90. And he goes, oh, yeah, that had a lot to do with it. You know, just that new grass growth, you know, probably drew a lot out of the, a lot of the nutrients out growing. So, you know, that there's that. So at least, you know, and that's, that uh, ammonium sulfate was cheap. I mean, just, it's just dirt cheap. It isn't right now, but it was then. I mean, $15 oh, a 50 pound bag. Yeah, it, it's not that expensive for the kind of performance that you get out of it actually so you know looking at this most recent you know that this set of test results uh you know i can see how you are reaching the point of diminishing returns from applying things like iron because mm -hmm. there are instances where even with what i do I stop applying iron because the grass just doesn't need it. Okay, it just doesn't need it. I, I mean, I'm I'm at that point as well. I think with especially with that the less. I mean, I, I I bought it. I might as well use it. So I didn't want to just mm -hmm. you know. I, that's why I don't use it as much. But um, I I probably won't buy it again. Uh, just yeah, just like yeah. you said, it, it's about as green as it's going to get. Yeah, and part of that green comes from the fact that, true or false, you renoed your lawn to varieties of turf that are inherently green. Because I'm looking at your lawn, and I don't see a fertilizer green or an iron green. Do you know what I see? Turf green. Yeah, I, I see grass that is performing at what we like to call in the business its genetic limit in other words you can't do anything else to this grass to make it greener because this is just grass that is performing well in, in the situation that it's in you know you can't do anything more i mean Anything more that you apply to this, do to this, etc., is just uh, you know spending money that you don't need to spend. Because yeah, this lawn just looks and that's like, a, and that's a good that's a good thought moving forward too. So yeah, yeah, that's just like you know, because Ryan, does this lawn look like it needs a lot more applied to it? <laughs> No, I mean, like I said, I think if you are aggressive in the fall, and when I say aggressive, I'm talking no more than two and a half pounds, probably two pounds would be fine. And then, yeah. you know, you have you have your half to three quarters of a pound in the spring, right? Right around mm -hmm. Memorial Day or slightly before. The rest of that time is just whatever. You can choose your own. I really don't care because you know what? The grass doesn't know and the grass doesn't give a shit whether it's something you bought off of YouTube <laughs> or something you bought in the store down the street. And you go ahead and you put that down in the summertime as a foliar wrap. I think you're going to be rocking and rolling, man. I think your P and K, maybe 
maybe next year you throw down you know some one 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 so a ratio of n to p to k that is all the same so a triple 12 a triple 19 whatever the case might be you can get that cheap locally at walmart you can go to a big box somewhere close by um, and pick that stuff up that's fine that's really all you need to keep this rocking and rolling because quite honestly your soil is pretty darn good i think you're going to be fine i think it's really just about managing n and if you're collecting clippings is understanding what your growth uh, potential is, you know, so try and keep track of, okay, Hey, I do this, I get this result for X number of weeks. And then it starts to tail off. You know, if you're, if you're willing to go to the level that you've already gone, tracking a little tiny bit of data will help you make some really, really good decisions as far as when to apply, how much to apply. And it's just going to be, I don't want to say trial and error, but it's going to be a lot more trial and then, judge observe and then reflect on that later on so that you can make uh adjustments to your program year over year um i just <clears throat> i just got one final uh note and i know this is getting into the couple hours here but every no, time i fine. see that that drone into that drone photo i always think i'm one of those guys now because you know how ryan <laughs> always shows an aerial photo of his yard and, and his is like the green yeah. grass and everybody else is brown I, I always see when I see that when I see that picture, I'm like, I'm one of those guys now. So uh, yeah, that's, hey, that's just my thought you on gotta, that. You, you know what? People, for whatever reason, nowadays there's something there's something wrong with um, people being proud of what they did, right? Now I'll say this: I am not one of those um, believers in the whole domination line and like. Like, man, like if you really want to take it to your neighbor or something like that, it, you got some deep-seated problems. But if you just want your own shit to be the best it can be, I find nothing wrong with that. That's, that is okay. It's when you start. I, like, I didn't man, do I this to make my neighbors look bad. I didn't do this. Yo, I don't think you did. Yeah. I think you did this as personal, as, as personal, like, hey, I see something here in front of me. I don't like the way it looks. And you know what? I think I can do better. And I'm going to try and I'm going to put my mind to it. I think and I'm I, gonna I, I, think I succeeded. I did. So I, I no, hundred percent. You knocked it out of the park. I think that's an awesome photo. I think that's a testament to what you did. And I think now the next challenge, this ascension of, Hey, I took something that was not really cool looking and I made it awesome. I think the ascension to this next level is going to be, how do we keep it that way? Right. And I, I do want to I do want to say this as a closing thought. It won't stay that way and look that way forever. There will be another renovation down the line. There will be, you know, um, situations and decisions and forks in the road that are fraught with peril. And it's like, ugh, you know, I, I just did this or I did this. Don't give in to the sunk cost fallacy that, oh, hey, I've already put this much into it. I got to keep going with it. Um, but at the same time, too, is plan ahead so that you don't have to go through that sooner than you should because i think you can do really really well with this and you ought to be proud of what you've done what you've accomplished thus far i think it's a tremendous achievement and i think you know people should check out your lawn journal because clearly you have your shit together and you got this one done and done very well so i applaud you for that ray any other well, you, final thoughts well i i think he's he's got he's got to go to uh his only fans right no oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's probably there, there there's probably somebody that wants him to uh, take the rotary scissors out with, you know, Ray, make sure you put the knot in it so you don't cut it off with the rotary scissors again. All right. We don't want you going to the emergency first. room. We need you for the show after. Yeah. Safety first. Safety first. But, uh, you know, I think you just did a, you know, fantastic thing. And this is a result of you really doing your homework, number one, and number two. Just remember, uh, less is more. Just kind of remember yes. that because uh, there are people that we encounter where uh, Ryan and I just have to ask, why are you doing <laughs> that? Why? Why? I mean, that is not we know necessary. Who those are. Yeah, we, we don't want to, we won't, we won't. We'll, we'll keep out of that section until the after show because 
that's where Ryan gets unglued, and I'm just rolling oh. my eyes. So <laughs> we we won't go there in the in the show show, but uh, but you know you are just you know an example of you know what we call good practices, and we like to see that. We really like to see that good practices. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that being said, uh, I really want to thank you, Matt. I think, you know, I, I love having people like you come on. I think for Ray and I and Matt as well, we just like talking to people that are passionate about turf, right? Hell and there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a clear passion here. Matt, I just sent you a super chat because you might need $4.69 with those Kentucky lot lizards, mm -hmm. at least for them to take <laughs> their top off. So. I mean, do what you need to do with that, sir. But um, all that aside, all the goofball stuff aside, um, it's clear you're passionate about this and that you want to do well. And those are the people we like talking to is that, you know, for whatever reason, um, they are successful, aren't successful, but they're passionate and they're trying and doing everything they can. It's clear that you're one of those people. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for having the... Uh, the stones to one, not only do this project, but two, put yourself out there and want to come on here, email Matt and, and ask to come on. We really appreciate that. So with that being I said, I appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah. I'm glad. I, same here. It was, it was definitely fun. So uh, have you ever, have you ever seen the, a show after Matt? No. Oh boy. Well, let me describe this for you. So <laughs> what we do, what we like to do, and this is, uh, we move from, um, between PG and PG 13 to NC 17 to almost triple X. Uh, there is no nudity, <laughs> but everything else goes. Well, we got raised and, coconut. So it, well, yeah, I mean, trust me, there, there's some large coconuts. Uh, okay. Don't let them fool you. So the, <laughs> the premise of this is that if you do want to see this, please go down and subscribe to the membership right down below. Just, just, just right down from the video here. Uh, subscribe to the membership. There will be a link for the uh, show after in the private Discord. So please make sure that your YouTube is linked to your Discord account so you can see that. That link will be live for 10 minutes and 10 minutes only after that. It will evaporate into thin air. You will never see it again. It'll go beyond the equator out into the black hole that is currently consuming some other galaxy and some faraway place never to be seen again. Now, once we get in there and you are in there, please understand that there will be some language that is not suitable for children, even grown adults who don't like the words. Well, I can't even say them right now. Uh, <laughs> we talk about and we keep it. We talk about current events in lawns and YouTube and we keep it real. So if you're interested in that, come check it out. With all that, I say thank you. J-Ping, can you take us out, please? <laughs>